who has a sister? Raise your hand. Who has a sister? Okay, very good. Uh, and I, I should be more. I should be more clear. So I will clarify my previous statement. And not only do I have a sister, I have an older sister. <laughs> I will not ask you to raise your hand if you, in fact, also have an older sister. I will not ask you to raise your hand if you are, in, if you are, in fact, an older sister. Because when you go from sister to older sister, that is sistering at an entirely different <laughs> level of sistering. Sisters are great, but older sisters are something else. I, I took the, the older sisterness of my world to a, to another place and, and that I married an oldest sister. I clarified in the first service. I will also clarify now. I did not marry my oldest <laughs> sister. I am Southern, but not that Southern. <laughs> She is also an oldest sister. She's got three younger sisters and one younger brother. So for the first 19 years of my life, I, I experienced an older sister in my own family. Uh, got married at 20, and then for the last 19 years of my life, I have, have shared everything with an oldest sister as well. So my uh, understanding and scope of older sister-ness I've seen it real time, in real time for a very long time. Can somebody say, God bless you, my brother? <laughs> and only people who have older sisters will know the needing, the need for that blessing, that extra blessing of being the younger sibling of an older sister. For me, having an older sister was like having an extension of my mother everywhere that I went. Yeah. <laughs> there was I got I got away with nothing. I would try to like be, you know, nothing. I got away with nothing, but at the same time, nothing ever happened to me either. I was always protected because the extension of my mother was always nearby. Okay, older sisters are very special, special people. Uh, my sister and I are 53 weeks apart to the day. 53 weeks. That's one year and one week. I say we're not quite Irish twins. Maybe yeah. a better uh, description would be Italian cousins. We're <laughs> <laughs> real, real, real close. And so everything that I did, I basically we Why did not? together. School things together. School dances. <laughs> Same same room, same room. Uh -huh. We did we did most everything together. My sister and I are close, not quite as close. I was talking with Caroline after the first service here. Uh, she's one of four girls, and she is one of the three that are the triplets that are her sister. She said something very profound to me earlier. My sister is 53 weeks older than me. One of her sisters is one minute older than her, and she said one minute. Still makes you older. <laughs> no matter. <laughs> it's older. I remember one day getting ready to go to school. We were waiting at the bus stop uh, to catch the bus. And we were standing out here. And I must have been in the fifth grade-ish. Uh, maybe sixth grade. But, you know, every fifth or sixth grade boy, we're like geniuses. Like, we just got it all figured out. And so we're at the bus stop. And there's this bee that starts flying around. And, like, bothering all the kids in the bus stop. I'm just trying to be cool, kick it with my kick with my friends and the bus in school and yeah, the bus <laughs> and, and this piece of like, listen, all you gotta do for a B is you just gotta swat it and it'll go away. <laughs> Dumb, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so the beast is coming I just start swatting at the bee and of course the bee stings me because that's what bees do is they yeah. sting you when yeah. you swat at them. Like so <laughs> stupid. And so I'm reacting to this bee sting, which is very painful, but I'm trying to play it as cool as I can because I'm in front of friends, right? Like, oh, all right, all right. And so my older sister, of course, is there and is tasked with the responsibility of never letting me get away with anything and also never letting any harm come my way has failed in her duties. And I'm here in pain, struggling with this bee sting. And, and, and you think maybe she could be like, oh, man, are you okay? Like, oh, can, let me see. Can I help you? But no, my older sister at the bus stop in front of all of my friends 
cries out in desperation and says, Tyler, baby, go see mama. <laughs> Needless to say, fifth grade was a long year for me. <laughs> Middle school was not great. Yeah. Because it started out with a, Tyler, baby, go see mama. Everybody say, God bless. God bless. The older sister. <laughs> Older sisters, they have an uncanny ability to be at the right place at the right time, either by coincidence or by assignment. Right? Yeah. Older sisters, I won't say that they always know what to say, but they always have something yeah. to say. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes what they have to say is really good. And sometimes what they have to say is... Tyla, baby, go see mom. <laughs> Older sisters are always positioned to somehow see everything yeah. all at once. Yeah. Older sisters, they see everything, and it seems like at least they don't let on that they don't know what to do because it always seems like older sisters know exactly what to do. They can see what's happening, and they know how to respond to it. Now today as we talk about what we can learn because of women, because of Moses' older sister, the main thought that I have for you and what we learn from the older sister today is that we learn to stay steady and ready. Steady and ready. Look at your name and say steady and ready. Thank you for participating. Because of women, we learn to stay steady and ready. Steady observing ready for action. Okay. If you are just joining us today, we have been tracking along through the first two chapters of the second book of the Old Testament, named the book of Exodus. This is one of five books written by a man named Moses, the same man that we're reading about today. Moses uh, accounted for his own birth in two chapters, and as he accounts or recounts his own birth in the way that he was preserved and prepared to be God's chosen uh, vessel for the deliverance of the nation of Israel, uh, he takes two chapters to tell us about the circumstances surrounding his own birth. Uh, if you're familiar with the story, you'll know. If not, here you go. At this moment in the, the history of the nation of Israel, they were enslaved in the country of Egypt. Pharaoh had enslaved the people of Israel. He was insecure. He did not know how to handle them and their growth, the growth of their population and the growth of their power. And so he just oppressed them to try and keep them from overthrowing his own regime and his own, uh, his own power. Uh, in that oppression, the people of Israel, the Bible says, grew stronger and stronger. Most of that growth is attributed to the leadership of women in this community. I just think that's such a beautiful thing, right? But at this moment in this story, the, the Pharaoh, the wicked king of Egypt, has said to all of the Egyptians, to all of Egypt, if a, a male baby, a bo baby boy is born to a Hebrew woman, to an Israel woman, you were to take that baby and drop him in the Nile River. He was so insecure, he did not, he wanted to control their growth and their power by ba basically eliminating an entire generation of baby boys. In chapter 2 is where we're going to read again today, uh, verses 3 through 10. Let's pick up together uh, as we, we jump, jump back into the story here. It says, but when she could no longer hide him, this is Moses' mother, Jochebed. If you want to know more about her, you got to watch YouTube from last week. We talked about Jochebed in great detail. It says, but when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it amongst the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister, the baby's sister, then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the river bank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, excuse me, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister, here comes the older sister again, approaches the princess and says, Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, do, the princess replied. Everybody say, yes, do. Yes, do. Remember those two words. We're going to circle back to those two words in just a minute. Yes, do, the princess replied. 
So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Can I have a good amen for the reading of God's word? Amen. 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 I love this story, and I love, um, I love what we learn about Moses' older sister. Okay? Biblical scholars have deduced with some uh, common sense and just some, some general reasoning that, that uh, this older sister would have been somewhere between the ages of 7 to 12 years old. What they cannot figure out is why Moses neglected to, to name his mother, his adopted mother, or his older sister in these first two chapters. But we do come to discover later on that this older sister's name is Miriam. Okay, This is Moses' older sister named Miriam. Named Miriam, and she was between somewhere to 7 to 12 years old. They believe her to be that age uh, because of the responsibility that she was given and the way that she handled herself like a boss. Come on, Come on. Somebody. like a boss. More on that in just a second. But they think that she would have been in that age range, 7 to 12. Now, so far in this series, uh, the women that we have talked about, the midwives and Moses' mother, they served in roles that would have been uniquely designated for women, okay? Culturally speaking, a midwife in this culture would have been a woman. Uh, a man would have only stepped in to help and, and aid in the delivery of a baby in like an emergency sort of situation, but a midwife, a female midwife, would have been the, the, the woman who was there fulfilling that role. Um, biologically speaking, Jochebed, Moses' mother, would have been the only person in, in Moses' family that could have been Moses' mother, right? So uniquely, roles uniquely designated for women in Moses' life. But as we talk about Miriam, Moses' older sister, and the role that she plays and the purpose that she fulfills, it kind of makes you wonder. If it doesn't make you wonder, it kind of makes, makes me wonder, at least, because this is where my male imagination goes as I read God's Word. And it begs the question, what if Moses had an older brother? Mm. Fair? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Moses did, in fact, have an older brother. His name was Aaron. Maybe you remember reading about Aaron in the Scriptures. But Aaron would have been about three years old at this time and not really um, qualified. Yeah. Right? To handle the responsibility of taking a baby, putting a baby in a floating basket, putting that floating basket in a, a major waterway, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then watching that basket throughout the day. But what if, what if, if Amram and Jacobed, those are Moses' parents, and what if their first child was Amram Jr.? <laughs> what if it wasn't Miriam? I can... can what I would call my, my humble but accurate opinion. I can tell you that in my humble but accurate opinion that if, if, if Moses had had an Amram Jr. and not a Miriam, Moses wouldn't have made it. <laughs> wouldn't have made it. Yeah. Uh, I have some experience being a 10, 11, 12 year old male. Yeah. I've had yeah. some experience. I also have three sons that I have raised and are raising as 10, 11, 12 and beyond year old males. Okay? I can tell you from firsthand, real time experience, that if Amram Jr. had been given the responsibility of keeping his brother alive in the Nile River, Moses wouldn't have made it. <laughs> Jacques tells Miriam, take your brother, put him in a basket, put the basket in the river, and then you park it right there by the river and you watch. That baby. You stay steady and ready. If Amram Jr. is hearing those instructions from his mother, let me translate to you what Amram Jr. would have heard. Take your brother, put him in the river, use the basket to sit on or throw around or like a ball of some sorts. Skip rocks in the river, draw doodle in the dirt until you get bored or hungry or both. Then go and fill your food desires. Go borrow some lunch from a neighbor. You do what you got. An 11 year old brother would not have been able to handle the responsibility of taking a baby, 
putting him in a floating basket, putting that floating basket in a river, <laughs> and watching that baby to make sure that he stayed alive. Everybody say, God bless. God bless. The young men. Yeah. Young men. Not every young man is like that, okay? I'm just saying. I, I know the ones that share my DNA are like that, so I can only speak from my own perspective. Yesterday, I asked one of them to go and get his lacrosse jersey. We're going to a lacrosse game. And he looks at me and he says, honest to God, Dad, I didn't even know I had a lacrosse jersey. And I said, you have played multiple games wearing this lacrosse jersey. No idea. Don't know where it is. Can't move it at all. Thank God for Miriam. <laughs> and it seems like, oh man, like how lucky is Moses? My God, he's so lucky. How lucky is Moses? Man, he got these midwives that are standing up to the evil king. He's got this mother that's like defying all the odds and being creative and innovative and, and, and using ingenuity and mother's discernment to like protect and preserve his baby. How lucky is Moses that he got an older sister and not an older brother? We got we to gotta get our mindset away from how lucky was Moses to how sovereign is God. God knew that Moses was going to need an older sister. Somebody who was there as an extension of his mother. Somebody who wasn't going to let him get away with anything and wasn't going to let anything come at him. Moses needed an older sister. Moses needed somebody who was a thousand percent best suited for the purpose that she was to fulfill. She stayed steady by the banks of that river and kept an eye on her brother in that basket. And when the divinely appointed opportunity presented itself, because of her steadiness, she was ready to present a divinely appointed solution. Right. To prepare and preserve her baby. <coughs> Why? Because Miriam was steady and she was ready. Steady and ready. Now how do we learn from her? What do we learn from her? How can we also stay steady and ready? I've got three keeps for you today to keep you steady and ready. The first keep that you need to keep is you need to keep your eyes on the prize. Oh, your eyes yeah. on the prize. It's very important to me that you understand the prize that we're talking about is not like some sort of goal, right? Not some sort of reward, not some sort of victory that you obtain after effort and this, that, and the other. The prize that I believe we are to keep our eyes upon is the prize that we find in our purpose. Not a goal, not a reward, but our purpose. Moses' sister, like I said, would have been somewhere between 7 to 12 years old at this point in her life. Scholars think probably towards the higher end of that scale uh, because of the responsibility that she was given and being uh, responsible enough to handle this baby boy in this basket in the water, uh, but also not old enough to where someone would have seen her kicking it next to the banks of the Nile River and been like, wait a minute, shouldn't that girl be working on something in her home? Shouldn't she have some sort of task or job that it is that she should complete perfectly suited for the purpose with which she was to fulfill? And she kept her eyes on that prize. She stayed steady on the banks of that river, laser focused on the baby in the basket that was floating nearby. She kept her eyes on the prize. And it sounds like someone in our children's ministry just won a prize. <laughs> if you have kids here, we give good prizes. <laughs> so it's church. How many of you guys think it's a good time to maybe expand our kids' space? Yeah. yeah. Woo. 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 See how I took that distraction and just totally flipped it on its head? There you go. Come on. That's Come new. on. Next level. Yes. That's new. Yes. 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 sister was steady watching. Steady watching her baby brother. Steady watching that basket. Be doing a thing on her business, but she always had, she always had, had eyes on the basket. Eyes on the basket. Uh, I wonder how often in your life, maybe like mine, uh, will you set out towards an end? 
something that you feel very strongly about, something I might dare say that you feel called to? How often do you set out towards an end, towards the fulfillment of your purpose, only to find yourself almost immediately distracted by other things that are happening around you? And then find yourself getting frustrated when those distractions cause delays. Right. right. And then find yourself even getting angry when those delays hold you back from fulfilling this purpose that you felt called to to begin with. And that resulting in you getting angry with God and blaming your distraction on some, some lack of faithfulness on his part. Wow. Like, dang, I didn't think you were going right to it today, Pastor <laughs> yeah. It happens, man. That sort of scenario I just described, that's little brother junk right there. Right? We get distracted, we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then we're like, wait, what happened? Where's the baby? That's little brother. <coughs> yeah. Older sisters, though, they're steady and ready with their, their eyes laser focused on the prize of their purpose that always lies before them. Look what the, the author of Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 4. He says, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Keep your feet from following evil. Did you notice the, the prepositions that he uses there? Those are prepositions, right? Before? Yeah. 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 Before, that's a prepositions. He says, he says look, look straight ahead. Keep your eyes fixed on what lies where? In front of you, not around you. And certainly not behind you. When you lose focus on the purpose that is before you, you will be distracted what is around you, and you will be delayed by what is behind you. That's good. Because in the kingdom of God, as a child of the Most High, there's only one way to go, and that's His way. And baby, His way is forward. His way is straight ahead. Yep. His way is narrow, which doesn't make it easy, but it does make it simple. Yeah. Wow. The way of the Lord. If you're someone who stays steady and ready, you're someone who keeps your eyes laser focused on the prize before you. Mm. Not the prize of some victory, but the prize of your purpose. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. A lot of times you, you can hear me or anyone talk about like your purpose, your purpose, your purpose, and it can create more frustration in your life because you're like, I don't know what my purpose is. And you ask yourself, what is your purpose? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you you? Yeah. Can, I, can I tell you something? You're, you're asking the right question, but you're asking the wrong person. Yeah, right. Stop asking yourself what your purpose is. Right. Ask God. Amen. So good. The Bible says that God knows the number of hairs on your head, which for, for some of us, it is easier for him to know that number than for others of us. Everybody say, God bless. God bless. The fallenly challenged. <laughs> That's all love there. I'm just joking. Uh, Something like, oh gosh, that. please don't leave me because you're wrong. <laughs> but if God can, listen, if he knows enough, to know the number of hairs on your head. Right. You need to tell me that he doesn't know enough to know the simple purpose for which he's called you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Give me a break. Yeah. Are you with me? Yes. yes. If you don't know, ask him. If you ask him and you're still not sure, listen, get in the growth track at Story Heights Church. Yes. Like, oh, shame, let's plug. <laughs> We created a system for the very predicament that you find yourself in. <laughs> in the growth track at Story Hunch Church, you will not only find yourself, but you will discover your purpose. Because, friend, who you are and the purpose that you have are not as far removed as you might have once thought that they are. That's right. Yeah. And I believe that as you discover yourself, you will also discover your purpose. And as you discover yeah. your purpose, you will have a prize to focus upon so that yeah. you can keep so moving good. straight ahead yeah. after what it is that God has called you to do. 
So good. There's some amazing people, and I love getting the emails about our growth track and the, the people who are taking it and participating in it. And there's been some amazing stories. I know Haley Turner has been recently completed the growth track. She's serving right now, taking care of, well, none of my kids, but maybe some of your kids, because all of my kids that are here are here right now. Right? She's, she's, she's fulfilling her purpose in the kingdom of God. There's another young lady in our church that's a part of our anomaly student ministry, uh, I think 13-ish years old, just finished the growth track at Story Heights Church. And she's an older sister, too. <laughs> Who's surprised? <laughs> Not me. But I love that. She's like, I'm not waiting until I'm done with college or in my 30s to try to figure out what my purpose is. Wow. She's like, I'm doing that now. Wow. I want to know what my purpose is. Big kudos to Vanessa if you're watching online. Vanessa. I'm proud of you. I think that's amazing. It's amazing. You want to know who you are? You want to know what God has called you to do? Ask him. Yeah. If you need some help, if you need a little assist with that, yeah. text growth track to the number on the screen. <laughs> Either way, stay steady and stay ready. Keep your eyes on the prize. Number two, keep your next move ready now. Keep your next move ready now. This was my second draft at this point. Um, when I decided I was going to try and be cool and keep them all as a keep, like they all started with keep. Uh, my first draft of this was to think one step ahead like a carpenter that makes stairs. <laughs> <laughs> of course, if you know, that is a quote from the office. So, <laughs> most of all of my theology comes from office <laughs> Think one step ahead. Keep your next move ready now. Keep your next move ready now. Uh, and the younger brother in me reads this and thinks from my perspective, uh, right? Mission accomplished. You said put the baby in the water and watch the baby. I did it. What happens next is nowhere in my scope of process, right? Not for an older sister, though. An older sister's not going to stand on the banks of that Nile River where there's a baby floating in the water nearby and get distracted and start doodling in the dirt and throwing rocks and like, no, no, no. An older sister, she's standing there thinking about every scenario that could come next. What if there's a crocodile? Get that crocodile. What if somebody sees us? What if somebody, what if somebody asks me a question? What am I going to do? What, what, what? She, she, my older sister, she kept her next move ready right now. Good. So when the unforeseen presented itself, she didn't find herself, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. She knew exactly what to do. She knew exactly what to say because she used her time of steady watching to prepare herself to be ready for acting on whatever it was that presented itself next. But even this older sister, I don't know if she was ready for what came next because the princess of Egypt, royalty in her community, showed up on the scene and found her baby brother. But young Miriam, as we read in the scriptures, she stayed steady and ready. She keeps her cool, and she stays ready now for the move that came next. I don't know if you understand the magnitude of this moment in Miriam's life. It, this would have been the, the, um, the equivalent of like the person that you admire the most. Maybe a celebrity. Maybe someone you've never actually met before, but that you've followed and tracked along with. Like for them showing up in your world, and then you knowing the exact perfect thing to say in that moment. You guys can imagine that yeah. scenario? Yeah. For me, it would have been like if, um, if if Kelly Kapowski showed up at my bus stop, right? <laughs> Don't remember Tiffany? <laughs> show, show them as older. Oh, oh, Kelly and Zach. They aged well, right? Yeah. I say God bless? God bless. Zach Morris. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Listen, if, 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 if Kelly Kapowski showed up at my bus stop the day I got stung by the bee, the bee sting in my hand would have been the least of my medical worries. Yeah. <laughs> my heart would have exploded in my chest. I'm going to call in Dr. Eric and be like, I need an ambulance, doc. I need some treatment. <laughs> help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. 
This princess shows up. This princess discovers her baby brother. This princess shows compassion. This daughter, this sister, recognizes, and there's something in her. There's a wiring in her as a woman that's showing compassion towards my brother. And she doesn't panic. She was steady watching. She was ready. And she knew her next move right then. I love that so much about Miriam. I love that she didn't run when the Egyptian women arrived. She was steady. I love that she remained at her post when the baby was found. She stayed ready. And I love that she wisely volunteered a woman to nurse this random baby, right? Because her next move was ready right now. Now, don't raise your hand on this one. This is one of those where I'm going to ask it, but I don't want to know. Okay? Okay? Don't raise your hand. Don't volunteer any information. God bless you. Don't do anything. But here's the question. When life pivots on you, because that's what life does, in case you did a minute outside of the real world, living a real life. Yeah, yeah. When life pivots, not if life pivots, but when life pivots, okay? And you find yourself in a situation that you did not expect to be in. How many of you could say, like Miriam, you are ready with that next move right then? Don't raise your hand. Okay, Ben, it's ready. She's ready. <laughs> Nobody else raised your hand. How many of you say, I'm ready. I know. I'm ready. I know. I know exactly what I would do. I, 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 would, I wouldn't get confused. I wouldn't get annoyed. I wouldn't get frustrated. I wouldn't get angry at the distraction. I wouldn't get angry at the delay. I wouldn't get angry at God. I would be able to stay laser focused on the purpose that he's put before me, regardless of how life pivots around me. I don't know, I don't know if many of us would be able to say that confidently. It was a tough question for me to ask my own self this week. That's why it's so important that we stay steady and ready as children of God so that we can, uh, we can know what our footing is as life pivots around us. But this is what the Apostle Paul uh, says about it. This is what he, he gives some good instruction on how we can accomplish this goal of being ready right now. He says this in 1 Corinthians. Be on guard, period. Stand firm in the faith, period. Be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. I love that verse not only because it's powerful, but I also love that verse because it's just generic enough that every follower of Christ can take it and apply it to the real world that they yeah. live in today. Yeah, that's true. Because every, because life is always life for everybody. It looks different, but it happens the same way. And life is constantly changing, and life is constantly pivoting. But I love the the, the advice and instruction that Paul gives us on how we can remain unchanged as life constantly changes around us. Yeah, that's good. Uh, lose your job? What's Paul say? Be on guard. Right. right. Steady and ready. Mm -hmm. Get your heart broken. Stand firm in your faith. Yeah. Good. Who had your heart to begin with? Mm -hmm. Can't pay your school loans? Be courageous. God will provide. Wow. You watch cable news? <laughs> yeah. Any of them? Be strong. You scroll through social media time to time? Do everything with love. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. It doesn't matter what pivot you find happening in front of you. When you stay steady and ready and laser focus on the purpose for which God has called you to, there is nothing that life can throw at us now that we can't be ready for next. Amen? Amen. That's good. You've got to keep steady and ready. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep ready now for what's next. And number three, you got to keep your cool when the pressure is on. Keep your cool when the pressure is on. Yeah. I love the boldness and the confidence of this 11-year-old young lady here. I absolutely love it. But the younger brother in me that will forever be a younger sibling cannot ignore the fact that at this point in the story, the older sister had completely failed in her responsibilities as an older sister. 
<laughs> what did her mother say? Watch your brother. Don't let anybody see him. What happened? She watched her brother, and people saw him. Failed. <laughs> so, older sisters, maybe you're not all you thought you were. <laughs> Some wounds. I'm working through them. Jada prayed for them. But she did. She didn't. She did not complete the assignment that was given to her. But she did fulfill the purpose that she was called to. Yeah. So cool. I think a true older sister would have said, "No, no, no. It wasn't that I that I failed. It was just an opportunity for a pivot presented itself. I took full advantage of." Jacques said, don't let anybody find your brother, especially the Egyptians. And so who found her little brother? The Egyptians. <laughs> Not just like Egyptians, but the daughter of the most powerful Egyptian of all the Egyptians. Yeah. Not only the daughter of the most powerful Egyptian of all the Egyptians, but the daughter of the wicked king that told all of Egypt to kill her baby brother. You talk about dropping the ball. She dropped the basket. She yeah. failed. She didn't. She did not complete the assignment that was given to her. However, she recognized this failure as an opportunity to change things around, okay. to kind of reverse course and pivot and make a new move. She kept her cool when the pressure was. On, and as her baby brother is being discovered by the princess of Egypt, what does she do? Boldly and confidently presents a brilliant solution to the daughter of the most powerful human in the then known world. That's cool. I admire that about you. Cool. I admire that about an older sister. The turning point of this story is contained in the two-word command that this princess gives to young Miriam. We said it earlier, remember? Yes, do. Yes, do. When the princess spoke those words to Miriam, Moses' fate was sealed and God's deliverer had been delivered. That's awesome. The deed was done. It was all wrapped up. Pharaoh's daughter had spoken. Yes, do. But don't be so quick to forget what those two words were in response to. What was she responding to? She was responding to a 12-year-old Hebrew girl's suggestion of, hey, I know you see this baby. You want me to find a nurse for you that can help take care of him? Look what it says. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. And went and called the baby's mother. I think it would go without saying that Miriam would have known enough Egyptian to be able to communicate with this princess in Egyptian. But don't lose the significance of that. This 12-year-old young lady is speaking in her second language to the daughter of the most powerful person alive in that day. Wow. And not only is she speaking boldly and confidently to her, she is speaking wisely. Wow. And she's speaking not only for her brother's benefit, but for the benefit of her family. As impressed as I am with the way that she spoke to royalty, I'm even more impressed with the conversation that's not recorded in the Bible. The conversation that would have happened at home after the princess says, yes, do. And Miriam goes home to Jacobin to explain to her what has happened throughout the day. Miriam wasn't live streaming all of this stuff. Come on, yeah. somebody, right? Like, she would have had to go back and tell the whole story to her mother. Can you put yourself in that room? Yeah. Can you put yourself in that moment? Hey, mom, I'm home. Hey, honey, how are you? Where is your, where is your brother? Where's his? Is the basket outside? Where's, where's Moses? Mom? I don't know. But it's not what you think. It's not what you think. Everything's okay. What do you? What do you mean? Everything's okay. Where's my? Where's your? Where is your brother? I never had a, a Jewish mother, but I did have an Italian mother. Come on, right? Like, I can imagine there's some parallels between the two. Where, where is your brother? Mom, it's okay. He's with Pharaoh's daughter. He's with who? Yeah. You lost your brother, 
And now you've let him go to the daughter of the man who is trying to kill him? Are you kidding me? Mama, mama, it's not as bad as you think. Listen to me, listen to me. There's nothing you can say right now. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing that you yeah. can say right now that would make yeah. this moment any better for you, yeah. that would make you any less better than you already are, woman yeah. standing here. You are dead. Listen, mama, listen. Watching my brother, I was watching him. But you gave me a bad assignment. <laughs> Is it older sisters? They go find a way to pivot that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was really your idea that failed. It wasn't me. It was your. And he floated away a little bit. And then these other ladies, they saw him. And yes, they were Egyptians, but one of them was Pharaoh's daughter. That doesn't help me, Miriam. What are you saying? Listen, here's the thing. She found him, and she felt compassion. I can tell that she was a mother. She knew what it must have been like to be this baby. And she was, she was worried about it. And so I stepped up and I, and I made this suggestion. I said, what if, what if I went and found a Hebrew nurse to take care of this baby for you right now? And she thought it was a great idea. You mean to tell me <laughs> that not only did you lose my baby, that an Egyptian princess found him, that now you're going to get some other lady to nurse him? No, 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 mom. That's the beautiful part. You're the nurse. Wow, man. That's so good. Can you imagine shopping in space? <laughs> and not only that, Mom, she's going to pay you to do the job <laughs> that you wouldn't have been doing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the job that you've been working so hard to keep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, not only. Do we never have to hide our brother in this house again? You're going to get paid to be his mom. What the hell? Yeah. You shocked me and be like, okay, I like my idea. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. Listen, as impressive as it is to me that Miriam spoke to authority the way that she did, it's more impressive to me the way that she must have spoken to her mother to explain the situation. Now, everything that I just did is speculation that comes from my imagination. I have no idea what that actual conversation looked like, but I can imagine it being something something pretty impressive yeah. for a 12-year-old to explain to her mother how she had lost her baby brother, right? It's impressive. But even beyond the fact that she spoke to royalty, even beyond the fact that she spoke to her mother, what blows me away is that this young woman she was bold enough and confident enough to speak. Period. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yes, it's good. She was bold enough in who she was. She was confident enough in the purpose for which she was called to that when there was no other option but for her to speak, that she opened her mouth and she spoke. It's good. And because she opened her mouth, her words affected change. Not only for her, not only for her brother, not only for her mother, but eventually for everyone that she shared a lineage with, the entire nation of Israel. The fact that this 12-year-old girl awesome. opened her mouth and spoke. That's awesome. She changed the outcome of an entire nation of God's chosen people. You've got to keep your cool when the pressure is on. Yeah. Christian, are you, are you following? Yeah. Right. Because if you, if you call yourself a Christian and you profess to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, can I just tell you, just, just all cards on the table, you're going to have to speak. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, you're going to have to say something. Preach it. There is a, a quote that has, has moved its way around Christian circles and and different settings and different things that is uh, wrongly attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. I'm pretty sure he never said it. But the quote is this, is that you're to, as a Christian, you're to preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. You guys ever heard that before? Out of all of the things that are not in the Bible, I hate that one the most. Because, because Christians, for as long as that has been a quote, have used that as an excuse for spiritual laziness. And it drives me absolutely crazy. Mm. Okay. How are you going to preach the gospel and not open your mouth? Right. Yeah. How are you going to be a witness to the love of Christ without opening your mouth? I'm not talking about 
grabbing a microphone and standing in front of a stage where these really bright, uncomfortable lights. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being a witness to the love of Christ on the stage of your own life. How are you going to preach the gospel and share his love and stay silent and hope that something happens? Yeah, come on. I'm not saying God's not big enough to do something with, with, with nothing. Come on. But why would you kind of put him in that position? In my, again, humble but accurate opinion, it is impossible to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ and not at some point open your mouth and profess that faith yeah. publicly okay. before someone. Now here's what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you, I promise you this is what's going to happen. Because I've had this little moment where I've gotten a little fired up now in front of all of you. Yeah. Like on Thursday, yeah. you're going to go to work. And somebody's going to look at you. I'm telling you, I'm telling you this is going to happen. Somebody's going to look at you and you'll be like, why are you so happy all the time? Yeah. Like a month ago, you were like not happy. And there was like all this stuff. And now I look at you and you can't stop smiling. Now I look at you and you just kind of start like laughing randomly. Like, are you okay? Like, what has changed? I promise you something like that's going to happen on Thursday. Maybe Wednesday. Yeah. Or Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. I promise you it's going to happen. And listen, in that moment, you're going to, your heart's going to start beating fast. Yeah. Your palms are going to get clammy. Yeah. It's going to get splotchy yeah. because you're going to think, oh my God, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be in that moment and it's like you and the Holy Spirit are there and he's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What are you going to say? Because <laughs> you can't be like, oh man, I had really good coffee this morning. What? <laughs> Oh man, no! You gotta have something to say. Right? Yeah. yeah. Come on. And if you say I'm a Christian, you gotta say it. Yeah. Listen, I don't know if what Miriam said was the best solution to the problem. It seemed like it worked out pretty good, but I don't know if it was the best thing. I don't know if it was the right thing. I don't even care because Miriam opened her mouth and she said something. Right. Right? Yeah. That's good. Take the pressure off of yourself, Christian, to have to say the absolute perfect right thing all of the time. Right. There's no obligation for that as a fully devoted follower of Jesus. It doesn't have to be perfect all of the time. Are you kidding me? Have you ever heard one of my sermons? Yeah. <laughs> Are you listening right now? Like, we have people go back and watch these just to count the number of heretical errors I made as I was speaking so I can repent for it later. It's like, you can't quote the notorious big B.I.G. on Easter. Like, that is not in the Bible. You know? It doesn't matter if you say it perfectly right all the time. It only matters if you have faith to say it. Yeah. That's so That's right. Keep calm under pressure. Because when the pressure is on, listen to me, that's when purpose is on the line. Yeah. Your purpose is on the line, but make no mistake about it. The person who is in front of you, purpose, pur their purpose is also oh, come on. That's so good. When the time comes, you're going to keep your cool under pressure and be willing to speak. Maybe the pressure of speaking is not really the pressure. Maybe the pressure of who you're speaking for is the pressure that you feel. Because, yeah, you are speaking for God Almighty. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. You know? <laughs> but I can tell you, God loves an obedient and willing heart. Yeah. If you're willing and obedient to speak up for what it is that you feel like He has said for you to speak up about, uh, He'll He'll give you the words. Yeah. He'll guide your steps. He won't, he won't let you find yourself lost or floating somewhere outside of what it is that He's called you to do. Amen. 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 Because of women, we learn to stay steady and ready. Steady and ready. Steady and ready. You guys feeling steady and ready? Everybody feeling good? Yes. Now, normally after three, we land in the night. But today I've got a bonus point for you. Come on. Yeah, I'm on. We're going number four. You guys with me? You got to keep your eye on the prize. You got to keep cool under pressure. You've got to keep your next move ready now. And number four, if you're going to keep steady and ready, you have got to keep freedom in focus. Ooh, freedom in That's focus. Good. There's no way, I don't think there's any way, except for if God had just dropped it in her heart. Uh, there's no way Miriam would have known 
that what she was doing to preserve her baby brother was going to ultimately lead to her own deliverance. Think about it. But what we do know that Miriam knew is that, that her brother's freedom not to become Moses, but to just be alive was on the line. And that freedom, his freedom to live his life and preserve his life, she never lost focus of that freedom. She kept his freedom in focus and in so doing, opened the door for freedom for herself, for her mother, and for an entire nation of people. All of the Israelites eventually experienced God's freedom and experienced God's promise. Awesome. It says in Galatians chapter 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Yeah. Did you ever realize that? That the purpose of you being free is more freedom? Mm -hmm. That you haven't just been made free for freedom's sake. You have been made free. You have been set free for more freedom. More freedom for yourself, but more freedom for others around you. And I'm not talking about American freedom. Like, God bless America and red, white, blue, and all those sorts of things. Thank God for American freedom. But I'm not talking about American freedom. Right. I'm talking about freedom from this, the, the, the bonding enslavement of sin yeah. in your life. Yeah. I'm talking about freedom from doubt and despair and disbelief. I'm talking about freedom from helplessness and hopelessness. I'm talking about freedom from the life that you plan for yourself and the life that God has purposed you to live. I'm talking about being free for more freedom. And whom the Son has set free, Paul says, is yeah. free indeed. I don't know if you realize this or not, but if, if you haven't embraced the freedom Christ died and rose again to give you, today's a great day to do that. Right. Why would you live another day without the true freedom that Christ gave us? Why would you make that choice to deliberately ignore and push away the freedom that Christ died so that you can have? Why would you do that? Yeah. Listen, your freedom is on the line based on your decision, but not only yours, friend. That co-worker that sits at the cubicle next to you, that, that guy that's standing in the line at Starbucks in front of you, the world in which you live, their freedom is at stake too. Yeah. Yeah. And if we don't find the faith, like this young woman Miriam, to stay steady and ready to walk in that purpose that God has for us, oh man, there's a lot that's on the line. I can't say for sure that I've always I've always done this perfectly. I can't. I won't. Does that happen? But I can tell you I've learned the longer, the more reps that I get, right? You guys like work out, you know what I'm saying? Some of you do, I don't, but some of you do. Like the more you do it, the easier it becomes. The more reps you, you get, the stronger that you get, the more reps that I've gotten. In this steadiness and readiness workout routine, the easier that it gets when life pivots. Okay? We're going to be okay. God is faithful. Yeah. We found ourselves in a season of, of waiting not too long ago. Anybody hate waiting? Yeah. yeah. God, waiting is the worst. Yeah. Yeah. So patience is not my thing. I'm like, I know how this should work out, so just work it out. Just fix it, Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> we found ourselves waiting, 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 waiting for an answer, for an answer, for an answer. We knew, we knew the answer was coming. We didn't know when it was coming. Yeah. And we found ourselves in this waiting, and the frustration started to creep in. And I looked at Crystal. I was like, Crystal, and that, she was actually doing great. I was the one who was struggling. I was like, we're okay. We know how to wait. We've done this before. And God is faithful. <laughs> We've waited before, and God is faithful. We've waited before, but God is faithful. Yeah. We've doubted before, but God is faithful. We've stressed before, but God is faithful. We've yeah. X, Y, or Z before, but God is faithful. Stay steady and ready. Steady and ready. You can literally live your life as a champion. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Hey, we're so glad that you stuck around for the entire message. You know, everything we do at Story Heights Church is done with the hope that we connect your story to God's story because we believe that God can and will take your story to new heights. 
So while you may not be with us in person, we still want to give you the opportunity to respond to the call of Jesus. Maybe you're watching right now and you'd say, you know what? And I've been trying to do my life my own way. Uh, and honestly, it's, it's just not working. And listen, we've all been there before. Uh, if you can say, I believe that Jesus died for me because he loves me and that you truly want to live in the fullness of what he has in store for you, I would encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, say thank you for your cross, for your love, for your grace and your forgiveness. Say, I was going my way, but now I choose to go your way. I want to make you my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sin and set me on a Hello. new path. Amen. Men. That's huge. That's such a big deal. You know, giving your life to Jesus is the first big step in a faith journey that's going to last the rest of your life on this earth. Yeah. So don't let it go unnoticed. We'd love for you to fill out our digital connect card at the link below because although you aren't with us in person, we want to get you connected. Yeah. If you don't live in our area and don't belong to a local church, we'd love to connect you with a great Jesus and Bible teaching one. And if you are in the area, we invite you to come in person because we believe church is essential to your spiritual growth. And honestly, it's just one big party every Sunday. So go ahead and click that connect card and a member of our team will be in touch. And that's really all we have for you now. And we hope to wait and see how God is moving in your life. So remember, keep letting God take your story to new heights. He's got such great things for you. It's the truth.